Hello. We're back. Okay. So, uh, one of the things we've been covering on this uh, is uh, a series of essays by Kaepernick Publishing. Yes, I say it every week, but I like to put in the intro. Um, it is a series of essays on the case for police abolition, uh, police and prison abolition. Um, this is the 19th essay in that series uh, called The Three Traps of Reform by Naomi Murakawa. Uh, Naomi Murakawa is, um, she's a, uh, associate professor of African American studies at Princeton. Um, she has several, several degrees actually, uh, it seems, and, uh, has BA in women's studies, a PhD in political science from Yale. Uh, author of The First Civil Right, uh, which I very much, it, it's on my reading list because it is, it sounds very interesting. Um, it's supposed to be a scathing uh, condemnation of American liberalism as being just as responsible for the carceral state as conservatives, which, as we're finding out through reading this series, uh, very much rings true. So I'm, I'm very curious to read that. But let's go ahead and get into it. Oh, before we get into it, this is intended to be a discussion format sort of thing. I will be not only reading, but interjecting my thoughts as we go along and encourage you all to do the same. Uh, if you have thoughts or questions as we're going, feel free to chime in. Okay. So, the three traps of reform. Uh, this again is part of the fuck reform section of the essays, which is all about pointing out why we can't just reform our way out of this. Why abolition is actually the answer. Police reform works. Or the police. Decades of reform have built an agile, deadly force that pushes millions of people into the largest carceral system in the world. Reform the police usually means reward the police. This is the first trap of reform. As a supposed concession to the first wave of Black Lives Matter protests in 2014 through 2016, well before George Floyd, the Obama administration gave police a gift basket, $43 million for body cameras. Body cameras have not delivered on early promises to reduce pol police use of force but they have expanded police surveillance powers, especially when equipped with facial recognition software. As police pro patrolled Black Lives Matter protests in 2020, they captured images of protesters by using the very technology that elites promised would contain some of the police powers that had sparked the protests just a few years ago. We also, just as an aside, have seen that the addition of body cameras has not meaningfully reduced even police killings. Um, it, that number of people who are, you know, extrajudicially executed by police remains steady, an unacceptably high figure, and even in cases. You know, a lot of times they turn the body cameras off, but even when they do have them on, n nothing happens. It's just justified. Even larger rewards for police departments come under the guise of feel-good cop-speak labels like community policing, guardian policing, or procedurally just policing. 
After mass uprisings against policing in the mid-1960s, the Johnson administration created the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration, which dispensed $10 billion in 1960s, mostly to local police, often in the name of improving racial fairness and police community relations. The more police brutalize and kill, the greater their budgets for training, hiring, and hardware. That point is highlighted, and it needs to be. Um, when analyzing systems, you do need to gamify them. You need to analyze them for what someone would do if they were removed, completely emotionally removed from it, and we're just seeking to min-max the system itself. And if being violent and killing people only results in expanded budgets and more equipment and more cops, there's no reason to cut down on violence and killing. There just isn't. The LAPD exemplifies this cruel exchange rate. Between January 1964 and July 1965, the 18 months before the people of Watts rebelled, the LAPD killed 64 people. Despite the fact that 27 of them were shot in the back, the police's internal affairs department ruled that 62 of the 64 were justifiable homicides. During the Watts Rebellion, the LAPD and the National Guard killed another 23 Angelinos, most of whom were black. Many thought the obvious. The LAPD must be reformed, professionalized, and better equipped and trained to fight crime without provoking protests that cost millions in property damage. As federal, state, and county budgets pumped millions into policing, LAPD Chief Thomas Redden was triumphant. It was the year of the cop. He said in 1967, adding, Everything you want, you get. And I say, I want more, and I should be getting it. That's quite a telling attitude. This history suggests that police, like banks, are too big to fail. When market crashes or mass protest shop stop business as usual, Elites deliver a bailout, for the authors of the devastation, not the people they left broke and broken. The protests of 2020 have popularized key abolitionist demands to defund police and abolish the prison industrial complex, but federal elites have instead doubled down on rewarding police particularly through the Community-Oriented Policing Services, the COPS Office, a 1994 Clinton administration creation that has already given $14 billion to local police. In June 2020, as total unemployment reached 18 million people, one in five families was food insecure, and Black, Latino, and Indigenous mortality rates for coronavirus were as much as double those of whites. Federal lawmakers prioritized hiring more than 3,000 more cops through the cops' office. If elected, Joe Biden promises to give another $300 million to community-oriented policing. This article was prescient. Joe Biden has, in fact, increased police budgets in general um, significantly. Uh, this is all part of the trap of reform. Uh, it it really does just pump more and more money into a failed system of a failed state. <laughs> yeah. uh. Policing is intrinsically predatory and violent. Police push millions of people into the carceral state where racial disparity and other inequities rise through each circle of hell. Black people comprise 13% of the U.S. population, but roughly 30% of the arrested, 35% of the imprisoned, 
42% of those on death row, and 56% of those serving life sentences. Those are some damning ratios. Nearly half of the people murdered by police have disabilities, and sexual violence is a routine but invisible form of police brutality used especially against LGBTQ youth, sex workers, undocumented women, and black women, and women of color. Who do you report it to when the police are the ones doing it? In this unchecked violence, we see reform's appeal, but also its second trap. Because police look lawless, reformers hope that new laws will rein in their power. But the premise is wrong. Policing is not law's absence. It is law's essence in a system of racial capitalism. In this system, laws affirmatively protect the police's right to racially profile, to lie, and to kill. Racism is not a contaminant that seeps into policing as if lawmakers left some loophole that dutifully reformers could, or dutiful reformers could close. Police saturate working class, black and brown neighborhoods with explicit legal permission. Courts validate endless police stops, stopping someone for walking in a high crime area? Perfectly legal. Searching a car for drugs because the black driver paused too long at a stop sign? Perfectly reasonable. As police commonly joke about racial profiling, it never happens and it works. Yeah. Um... Something I had a conversation with some folks about yesterday. Um, there are, you know, there are various slogans out there. Defund the police, you know, all cops are bastards, etc. And, you know, they were saying, yeah, well, you know, those slogans are alienating and whatnot. And, uh, while I agree they can be off-putting, the trouble is actually articulating how many systems and how defunct this whole thing is requires getting someone to sit down and actually have the conversation and listen. Uh, and a lot of folks don't really have the willingness to do that. Uh, those kinds of slogans are helpful at provoking a reaction and sometimes getting people to say, okay, what, what, what are you actually saying? The unfortunate part is a lot of folks who deploy that kind of messaging also aren't really able to themselves fully articulate these sorts of things because it it takes a lot of work uh, I mean we're reading what we're reading in this series is just scratching the surface and it even that is pulling on years and years of expertise into these subjects and tons of research into these subjects from some of the brightest minds. So, you know, your average protest goer is just, they're, they're just not going to be equipped to make the convincing case to someone. And unfortunately, the case is not succinct. To understand the need for police abolition, you do need to be willing to sit down and actually analyze how all of these things fit together, why the courts, the police, the prisons all are coordinated because of um, overlapping personnel goals, you know, incentives to fundamentally create a system that is this racial capitalism thing. 
Um, yeah. So it is, it is very easy to fall into these traps because they're very appealing. They sound good. Like, a lot of the reforms that get pitched, you can, you can pitch them very easily and they can be very easily understood. But it's like, it's like trying to put a band-aid on your arm when you have a disease in your lungs. It's not actually going to solve the problem. Reformers try to enhance people's procedural rights as if arming individuals with legal protections might slow down the churn of criminalization, but consider the crowning glory of the procedural rights revolution. The 1966 Miranda v. Arizona Supreme Court decision requiring cops to recite the speech that contains some version of, you have the right to remain silent. Outraged conservatives griped about liberal courts handcuffing the cops. But police simply learned a new protocol. After Miranda rights are read during an arrest, most people waive their rights and police secure incriminating statements in more than half of all interrogations, rates comparable to those pre-Miranda. Police routinely use lies, intimidation, and confinement in interrogation, but simply saying the magic words became proof of professionalism. In short, Miranda offers good protection for police not the people they interrogate. This is the part that's relevant. A lot of these arguments, you know, um, some folks worry that the debate about policing is rooted in, um, in emotional appeals, but in all of these essays, there's there is data backing them up. You can look into it. It's it's all linked up. But yeah, the Miranda rights had no impact on people self-incriminating. Police just changed how they secure those self-incriminations from people. And that's how it ever goes. Um, yeah. Reformers try to regulate police use of force, but rules are also instructions. In the 1985 Tennessee versus Garner decision, for example, the Supreme Court held that Memphis police wrongfully killed Edward Garner, a black child in the eighth grade. It was wrong to shoot a child in the back, the court found. Such violence was justifiable only if an officer feared deadly injury to bystanders or themselves. In effect, a ruling on the illegality of killing gave police something more, instructions on how to kill legally. Police learned the script, I feared for my life. Hi, Mona. Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, if, if cops forget their lines, then internal investigators help them remember. After Chicago police killed a child, identified in a Department of Justice report only as an unarmed teenager, the police internal investigator steered the cop towards exoneration with this question. You were in fear for your life, so you fired how many times? We believe in a world where there are zero police murders because there are zero police not because police are better trained or better regulated, writes the organization known as H. Abolition. This brings us to the third trap of reform. Because reformers refuse abolition, they can only tinker with the techniques of police violence. This is a refrain that I have started saying almost weekly but it is that police as they are are exclusively a instrument of state violence that is the job to be a instrument of state violence 
they don't have a function to positively affect communities. Um, they aren't instructed or incentivized to assist people uh, unless they consider that assistant being assistance being the deployment of state violence against someone else. So yeah, that is all that you can do if you're reforming police, because that's all that modern police are. Chokehold bans, for example, prohibit a technique of killing, but not the fact of killing. The bans are nonetheless hailed as victories, and New York City just celebrated its recent ch chokehold prohibition. But the New York Police Department prohibited chokeholds once before in November 1993. It was hailed as a victory then, too. From 2006 to 2013, nearly 2,000 New Yorkers came forward with chokehold complaints. Just weeks after cops killed Eric Garner in 2014, the NYPD used the chokehold on Roseanne Miller, a black woman who was seven months pregnant. After they confronted her for barbecuing in front of her house, the departmental, departmental ban was in full effect. What trajectory of progress is this to ban the chokehold again, but allow police to kill with flashlights, fans, stun guns, handguns, and chokeholds by another name? An analogy can be made to death penalty reformers who replaced the noose with the electric chair and then replaced the electric chair with chemical cocktails. Reformers witnessed the horror of electrocutions that set heads aflame, and so they came up with a better way. But better for whom? The technique of execution does not comfort the dead. It comforts the executioners and all their supporters. Reform is the perpetual bailout. The lifeline tossed to police every time people demand a better world, not better punishment. We pursue reform on the premise that the system is broken, but as Maryam Kaba tells us, the system isn't broken, but highly functioning just as the powers that be intended. I agree, and I will add to this. Police reform does not fail. It works for the police. That was a kind of a shorter one by Naomi Murakawa, but she raised some very, uh, very important points. Um, and they're points that I do think get overlooked a lot. Again, it is very difficult to convey this concisely to especially white liberals who are still on the reform train because they have to digest a lot of information to first arrive at the necessary conclusion that police are exclusively a system to deploy state violence. They are not a positive influence. Um, from that premise, from only that premise, you can work towards understanding the need for abolition. Um, I'm still trying to develop my own rhetoric to make this case more convincingly to those who are privileged enough to not have to deal with, with these things. Uh, because, unfortunately, you know, uh, the electorate is primarily the white uh, liberal community uh, who aren't the target of these sorts of things. And so the problems are invisible and the solutions are academic exercises. Uh, having no skin in the game, it is very easy to just kind of consider from the armchair what should be done. 
Um, and I try to remain cogent that I am also someone who personally has no skin in the game. Um, but I try to be, you know, adamant on the fight anyway. It's, yeah, it, it's very much, it, it very much goes to the whole, if none are free, it, if some are not free, none of us are free sort of mentality. And that needs to be internalized more. If some are being persecuted, all are being persecuted. Um... And a way to kind of think about that is to think, like, long term, um, even if your motivations for whatever reason are entirely selfish, long term, if marginalized communities are erased, which seems to be the goal of especially conservatives, but liberals give them cover. Um, eventually that will be aimed at a broader and broader net of people because that path always leads towards a goal of absolute homogeny of thought. Uh, that destination is one-party fascism. Um, and if you're not on board with that, uh, then it will eventually aim at you. You will eventually be on the chopping block. So even if your goals and your intentions are purely selfish, it still is worth it to get on this train and start calling for police abolition. You don't have to be the target of it now. You will be. Or your children will be. Anyway. That was The Three Traps of Reform by Naomi, uh, Naomi Murakawa. I hope folks got something out of that. It was particularly quiet today, but... That's understandable. It was also kind of short today. Let's shift.